of my PhD thesis titled Diffusion Data Driven Perception of Dynamic Cameras. I want to lead in with a um, Want to lead in with a video showing basically what human and animal vision systems are capable of today. These systems are remarkable because they have a very high level of versatility, adaptability, are very robust in these kind of changing and very dynamic uh, and highly challenging scenarios. And what's especially astounding is that they managed to do all of this with very little power that on the order of one thousand. And uh, us. Uh, vision and robotics researchers were heavily inspired by this kind of behavior. Past uh, 60 years, a research has been dedicated to basically developing systems similar to this and has been devoted to studying frame based cameras. However, frame based cameras have a few disadvantages, namely motion blur and high dynamic and a low dynamic range, which basically generate. Uh, saturation and uh, blur artifacts in the image, which can degrade algorithm performance. And since we are uh, recording data in a frame-based fashion, we also have an added temporal latency, which can basically endanger our lives. Center point of my PhD thesis was event cameras. So we tried to uh, develop algorithms using these novel types of sensors to overcome uh, these limitations of standard frame-based cameras. Base cameras uh, are biologically inspired sensors, which instead of measuring absolute intensity frames, only measure changes in intensity, and then generate a spatial temporally sparse stream of data, here visualized as this kind of spatial temporal uh, spiral of events. Due to this working principle, event cameras have a very high dynamic range, being able to image even in these challenging scenarios where we exit a tunnel, uh, they also have a very high temporal resolution, which allows us to capture high-speed phenomena with uh, high fidelity and with very low motion blur. And finally, they also have a very low latency, making them very interesting, for example, for robotics applications. So looking at these last two applications, we can ask ourselves, why don't we actually use just a high-speed camera to solve them? High-speed cameras uh, can capture the world with a high temporal resolution and a very low latency, but it's, but because we have a very high frame rate, they try to they basically oversample uh, see, uh, points in the scene which are static and thus lead to redundant information capturing, and thus they actually incur a high bandwidth. Instead, we could opt for a low frame rate camera, um, which has a lower bandwidth, but then we trade off uh, latency. Unfortunately, it's not possible to simultaneously optimize bandwidth and latency for a frame-based sensor because they basically have a frame rate. And cameras don't have a frame rate, and for this reason, they can simultaneously have a low bandwidth uh, when there's, for example, no motion in the scene, but also maintain a very low latency. And this makes them especially interested, interesting for, um, for scenarios where things change, where there's once maybe slow motion, once fast motion, so we can adapt to the scene. However, this advantage comes at a cost. Because event cameras now measure changes in intensity and sparsely, uh, we have to redevelop many of the algorithms which exist nowadays for standard frame-based cameras. Um, since the advent of deep learning, there's been an explosion of research in event-based vision. Many of the works nowadays, many of the state-of-the-art works, now use deep neural networks processing events as dense frames. And here you can see a few applications of them. For example, they have been applied to moving object segmentation, um, high speed and high dynamic range video reconstruction, slow motion video generation with uh, frame interpolation or optical flow generation in highly dynamic and, and, and challenging illumination conditions. These methods are highly robust because they leverage deep neural networks. A lot of research has gone into them. They also leverage uh, very mature learning techniques like back propagation, but the, uh, one of the disadvantages of these approaches is that they still they don't take into account the state of the sparse in the event. For this reason, they're actually highly inefficient. For this reason, a number of applications, a number of um, a number of uh, papers have appeared which try to solve this issue by um, introducing a sparsity and synchronicity aware algorithms. These algorithms are highly efficient, but because they often rely on shallow features or um, or handcrafted features, or on exotic uh, neural network architectures, which are not easily trained, they typically don't scale to the same level of robustness as previous approaches. 
thesis, I tried to combine the advantages of both, uh, of both systems to achieve and even uh, reach beyond biological vision systems, which are situated here on the top right. To understand why state-of-the-art methods are so inefficient, let's look at an example. Here I'm showing you a spatial temporally sparse set of events being processed by a neural network. However, since we are now looking at a point cloud, uh, we can't actually use standard networks. For this reason, uh, many researchers first uh, form time windows of events and then aggregate them into frame-like representations, which are, which are dense. Frames are then processed with the deep neural network, typically a con, LSN, a con a net or nowadays transformed. Um, if we also have images, these images are used to synchronize the time windows and then uh, later merged uh, together before passing to the neural network. Now, looking at this architecture, we can see that we maintain the low motion blur and the high dynamic range in the events, but we actually lose the high temporal resolution and low latency. And uh, this is because uh, we are actually synchronizing and, and framing these events. And this is uh, this basically goes against the sparsity and the synchronous nature of them. So my research question in this thesis was, how can we actually reconcile both the robustness of traditional methods here and the asynchronous and sparse nature of events to get simultaneously robust, but also uh, efficient um, data-driven perception? And also, how can we then optimally fuse them with images? So to study this problem, I first dedicated part of my PhD to studying event representations. Here you can see a classical setup. We have raw events generating a dense representation, and these depend on a set of, num a set of hyperparameters, such as number of channels or um, timestamps, and etc. Uh, a number of um, a number of papers have appeared which uh, which study these event representations. They propose new ones and then compare them against old ones. And uh, this field is basically growing uh, ever since I started the PhD. However, um, when we actually want to select a uh, representation, we have to first train a neural network with a given task and then uh, check the validation score. And then we can actually, based on the validation score, uh, choose our, our representation. And as you might now guess, this is actually quite an expensive process. We don't want to do this for every single new representation that we that we uh, that we might uh, devise. This reason, I thought, isn't there a faster route? Um, essentially, in light of actually removing this frame framing operation, which loses the asynchronous nature, could we actually just look at how much information is preserved? while going from raw events to dense representations. And in doing so, I developed a, a method to basically um, compare the information content between raw events and dense representations based on the gromo fasserstein distance discrepancy. What's, what's nice about this formalism is that computing this information is actually 200 times faster than uh, training a neural network. And it also is network and task agnostic, so we can actually have a more general representation at the end. And now the kind of most important part is that empirically we found that this discrepancy perfectly correlates with task performance. What does this mean? So here on the x-axis, you can see the task performance, and on the y-axis, this discrepancy. And what you can see is that as we are lowering the discrepancy, the task performance increases for different representations and for different neural network backbones and different colors. Also verified this for different data sets and different, uh, different tasks. And we're able to conclude that uh, essentially um, reducing this uh, information loss is actually crucial to, uh, to get a better representation. By then doing an, uh, a Bayesian optimization over representations, we could find even newer and more exotic uh, representations, which are more, uh, more powerful than existing ones. Does this actually mean that we can get away with not uh, touching events, actually just processing in the raw form so that we can maximize the information? It was the topic of um, the second part of my PhD, where I was basically studying different ways in which raw events are being processed by sparse models. One set of uh, models are spiking neural networks, which model events as spatial temporal spike trains, which activate a dynamical system. However, since these models are still quite new, the training techniques are not yet fully developed and kind of possible. Instead, some people have considered events as spatial temporal point clouds. So you could actually process events 
uh, in this way uh, with, for example, point net or deep set architectures. However, since these are just operating on points, we don't have a topology, so we don't have a way to say how close are events. For this reason, um, graph-based approaches have emerged, which a model events as spatial temporal graphs you can see here. And here we are now actually imposing a topology on the events uh, based on the edges which connect them. Finally, here is another uh, way of processing events, which models uh, events as a grid on a kind of sparse uh, plane. So these two um, approaches here look very nice because they have a very easy training uh, process, but however, they're not asynchronous, it means that we cannot process events by events uh, efficiently. In, in this way, now raises the question, can we actually develop and take these networks and convert them into asynchronous models? This is basically what I did with asynchronous neural networks. So here you see how these asynchronous neural networks are trained and then deployed. First, we train them on synchronous time windows of events and with standard backpropagation rules to train for a given task. Um, for crucially, because we are now not using, for example, convolutional neural networks, the activations that we are generating are not no longer blurry, but actually sparse. And this gives us additional sparsity awareness in our uh, data-driven model. Later, we deploy these models as asynchronous models, which process events event by event and very efficiently and, and, uh, and locally. So let us look at how, for example, the naive implementation of an event by event processing pipeline would work. For each new event, you would have to reprocess the whole neural network activations, and this is highly inefficient. However, um, we can leverage the insight that individual events only give us local information change. And then we can use this local information change to significantly limit the computation graph um, generated in this way. This way, we can significantly cut down the, uh, the, uh, the computation necessary. So let us look at how these uh, methods actually compare when we look at now an efficiency. So flops per new event, how much computation do we need to incorporate a new event into the prediction, and how performant these are in terms of MAP. We see that the uh, CNN-based methods are highly robust, but they are also highly inefficient. The first iteration of this uh, of, of these asynchronous networks, uh, I, I implemented these uh, this formalism with submanifold sparse convolutions. Here, you can essentially see in every layer what are the nodes that are being updated at each new event. And that this network has two orders of magnitude lower computational complexity but actually is still underperforming in terms of uh, compared to state-of-the-art methods. This reason, I transitioned to, to uh, asynchronous graph neural networks, which now um, boost the performance by 16 MAP, bringing them on par with state-of-the-art feedforward methods here in the triangle, and, but, and also reduces the complexity by additional orders of magnitude. So looking at this plot, we still have uh, one last contender that we want to outperform, namely the, the recurrent neural networks. And now the question is, how can we actually close this gap? Taking a closer look at how recurrent neural networks work, here on the left, the feedforward network, and on the right, a recurrent one, we see that the principal advantage of viewing, using recurrency is that they can actually see objects when there's little motion in the scene. This is because recurrent neural networks rely on motion invariant representations. Motion invariant representations are then being propagated with events. The next part of uh, this talk, I'll talk about how we use motion invariant representations, in particular images, to overcome the limitation of feed forward methods. So um, here I'm going to show you a few projects, the first of which is asynchronous event and image based feature tracking which use an image as a motion invariant representation and then propagate this information using events. Here you can see how frames are used to initialize corners and then use, and then we use events to propagate these corners over time. Feature tracks are, have a very high temporal resolution and are highly accurate. Even when we have high speed motion, and like in this case, we can see, for example, that frame-based methods are uh, quite challenged by the large displacements and the motion blur uh, um, apparent in the images. And what this allows us to do is to track in the blind time between frames uh, with up to two times higher accuracy and three times longer feature tracks 
than, uh, than traditional event-based methods. Other application of this scheme is event and image-based video frame interpolation. This algorithm, we basically use keyframes left and right and propagate the information from these keyframes into the middle to generate a higher frame rate video. Here is again a schematic of how this works. So we are basically generating the intermediate um, images between two timestamps T0 and T1. What's interesting is that using events, we can now uh, overcome some limitations of frame based method, namely that frame based methods, since they only see two images, they cannot have any nonlinear motion uh, information unless you add more images. And also, Events measure uh, intensity directly, so we can actually overcome some of the limitations due to brightness constancy uh, assumptions. I'll show you um, a video of a very, very low frame rate um, and challenging scenario with a lot of reflections and nonlinear motions, which is uh, which basically is generated into a high speed video using our method. See that with the events, we can reconstruct a lot of the missing details that were missing in the original video. This method is over five decibels higher than image based methods. And what's interesting is also because we have so much information between frames, we can actually use much lower frame rate cameras and reduce the data footprint of these algorithms significantly by over a factor of 40. However, these methods are still operating on dense frames. So how can we actually um, uh, solve this? This is what I did in my last project in which I combined the ideas of the asynchronous and sparse neural networks uh, here on the top and the uh, dense neural networks um, uh, on the bottom. And the way that this algorithm works is it first uses an image to generate a set of object detections, which are then um, propagated using the events. So you can see now that with events, we were able to track the object over time. Although you, you would not say track, but you would actually say redetect uh, because we don't have an ID. What's interesting is that um, this method now allows us to detect objects before they become visible in image frames. And this allows us to basically peer into the blind time between frames. Here I'll show you another example of, of what I was talking about. So here you can see that uh, because we are using events, we can actually already quite early detect uh, the pedestrian running onto the street before the frame-based algorithm can do it. Also quantify this improvement by looking at how the object detection performance varies over time. So as we are uh, entering the blind time between frames here, 50 milliseconds, we see that the event-based uh, performance maintains a high level of accuracy while the image-based performance significantly degrades. This degradation is in fact over 11 MAP. And if we now look at uh, how this degradation varies as we change the frame rate of the, of, the, of the camera, we can see that as we are having a very low frame rate, so low bandwidth, have a very low performance. But as we are increasing the bandwidth or the, uh, the frame rate of the camera, we can increase this performance. So essentially we are now moving along this axis and sampling the, the uh, point along this red line. Right here. Now, uh, our system, which has a 20, frame rate, 20 hertz camera plus events, uh, we can see that at the same level of bandwidth, we are behaving like a 45 FPS camera, but have a latency of a 5,000 FPS camera. And this is by combining events with a low frame rate camera. And we can see that the improvement that we get by doing this is actually uh, quite significant, so 2.6 MAP. Conclu to conclude, uh, I want you to remember that uh, information loss is in going from raw events to event representations, uh, first of all, deteriorates learning. Then um, that sparse learning methods can basically made, be made asynchronous and highly efficient by using these localized update rules. Then, uh, in order to overcome the limitations of feedforward methods, we can leverage mode invariant uh, representations. Finally, to leverage these uh, representations with events, we can propagate them uh, forward in time to see the blind time between frames. 
So looking back back at where we have uh, reached with uh, with this with this uh, last iteration of, of this algorithm, you can see that we are getting closer to biological vision systems in combining both efficiency and robustness. But we still have a ways to go. With that, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank my professor for giving me the opportunity to uh, work under his supervision. Also to thank all of my lab members and family who have been really supportful, uh, supporting during this uh, during this journey. And, uh, and have made my stay at the at RPG that much better. So I'd like to thank my reviewers who um, took the time to look at my thesis and uh, I'm sure I have given very valuable feedback. So with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions and 